I'm going to invite up Jim Rolfe, who will be teaching us today. He is responsible for a lot of the creativity. <laughs> so if we could give just like a round of applause already for Jim, that would be fantastic. Uh, I'm going to yeah. pray for him, and he will get started, and I'll pass around some scriptures as well. God, I thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for Jim. I just pray, God, uh, that you're with him today, uh -huh. that he would speak with your authority, with your spirit. Uh -huh. And would you let us be open to him and, more importantly, to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Josh. I tell you, I'm from Texas. Days like today, the long winter appears to finally, finally be over. I've got to confess, I don't know if you, I've got a lot of Facebook friends from, uh, from the Lone Star State still. They got a quarter of an inch of snow two weeks ago, and it shut down absolutely everything. I said, you know, you need to come to Connecticut. It's a little bit different up here. But I'm really glad that uh, it seems that summer or spring is on the way. Now, as Josh mentioned, we are in the middle of a Lenten series. Uh, the idea is we're talking about something called a costly love. Uh, Lent is a 40-day period that leads up to Easter when we celebrate the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Can we get a slide up there, maybe? It's not an overhead. It's, yeah, it's music. Uh-huh. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm not doing something right here. It's, it's not projecting. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Costly love. So, so the idea is... Uh, for Lent, we don't, sell it, we, we don't focus as much on the resurrection piece of things as the crucifixion piece of things. That is, things die. And what does that look like in our life in particular for things to die? Now, in one sense, we can say that a costly love, the ultimate expression of love was this costly love of Jesus in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And so what particular piece of that would we like to experience in our own life? How would we like to help other people experience that in their lives as well? And, and so tonight we're talking about love is truthful. Now, there's only a million things you could say about love is truthful, about truth in general. And if you want to know more about that, we can ask some of the philosophers in our room. And we do have a few. John, ask John Pitter later what truth means. He can give you lots and lots of definitions. I'm going to give you some fairly simplistic thoughts about that tonight, I think. But in order to get a sense of what this could look like, I've got to do a survey, right? I'm, a, I'm an educator. I teach across the street, actually, in the math department. And so my first question, as I try to get to know you, the audience, tonight, is anybody here get the news from the 6 o'clock news? Yeah, one, two of us. That's what I thought would be the case. That's right. I didn't realize that you still got the news from 6 o'clock news until over Christmas my in-laws visited me and every night at 6 p.m. the TV had to go on showing Mr. Brian Williams on NBC. That's right. Now, I don't know if you know the news about the 6 o'clock news. In fact, the news about Brian Williams, who's the news anchor for NBC News, but he's in a little bit of trouble these days. I don't know if you've heard about this. In fact, he's on a six-month suspension, and given the fact that only one other person in the room dared to raise their hand, my guess is that nobody knows that he's on suspension right now <laughs> for six months. But the reality is he had a little problem with the truth. He didn't tell the truth in some situations. And so I'm going to take a little, we're gonna do a little quiz here, a little pop quiz. Can you identify which of the following actually represents his issue here? Uh, truth be told, America, I actually killed Osama bin Laden, number one. Is that, is that... A little white lie that he told. Uh, number two, when ISIS beheaded me, I couldn't eat for a week. Uh, by the way, just Google Brian Williams' truth, all these pop up. <laughs> uh, when I was in the Iraq war, my helicopter got shot down and I lived to tell about it. Number four, oh, some hands go up. Oh, so we were at this bridge and Frodo says to me, here, oh, this is my favorite, take the ring. <laughs> yeah. So many of you had an idea. One, two, three, or four. You got four fingers on your hand. Which one are you voting for? <laughs> yes, it happened to be number three. Now, how in the world do you <coughs> misremember <laughs> whether your aircraft took heat in battle and went down or not? I don't know. But somehow, Mr. Williams forgot the facts about that. So his suspension... Uh, NBC Universal President Stephen Burke wrote, by his actions, Brian has jeopardized the trust of millions of Americans place in NBC News. His actions are inexcusable and this suspension is severe and appropriate. Uh, it goes on to say, 
Uh, in the coming months, NBC will weigh whether Williams can regain credibility and re-earn the trust of his audience. And so in some fashion, this idea of truthfulness and trust are inextricably related. Uh, I read another journalist this week that goes on and says, the Society of Professional Journalists lists several pillars of journalism ethics. Who knew? I'm not a journalist. I did not know this. So seek truth and report it, minimize harm, act independently, be accountable and transparent. And yet another journalist says, the responsibility of journalists is to be more transparent than the politicians that they interview. And so apparently there is this triad of things that seem to go together, this idea of truth, trust, and transparency. And so I've got this little triangle that I'm going to suggest that we're going to explore tonight. What's the relationship between truth, trust, and transparency? If you happen to have your Bibles and you want to turn to 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12, we're going to spend most of our time there this evening. This is a very famous story, actually. Many of you have probably heard it. It's the story of, of a guy named David and... Ba Oh my, could this be the king himself? Is this king? David, right? Yeah, Dave, this is awesome, man. It's awesome, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. We're actually just about to talk about you. Apparently these people don't know you're supposed to bow. All right, all right. So Dave, I hear you have a, a pretty big birthday coming up, is that right? Yes, it's five oh. Cool, cool, how do you feel about that? You're pumped? Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Now, I know you've been out fighting a lot of wars these days. you still got the juice inside. I don't know. What do you think? Okay. All right. You did? I heard rumors. I heard rumors. Yeah, that was pretty cool. I don't know how you pulled that one off. That's pretty cool. Now, listen, there are some rumors going around. I don't know if you've heard them. I've heard them. There's this rumor about some chick named Bathsheba. I don't know. Are they... Can you tell us about that? Well, uh, Bathsheba, I can see that was a, a mistake now. Uh, mistake by the lake? Uh, yeah, I was, I, was, I was in bed. Uh -huh. uh, I got up one, one evening, mm -hmm. um, went up to the roof, kind of surveying the kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, up. yeah. And I saw this uh, beautiful woman uh -huh. bathing. Okay, okay, well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so I, uh, you know, I uh, sent for her. Okay. And had her, had her come. Okay. Um, we, you know, there was, we uh, slept together. Oh, okay. Mm hmm. It was a mistake. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, but I mean, she should have been bathing in, in the open. Yeah, take a bath, so that's not a good thing, I guess. No, you know, no, 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 okay. You know, I got it. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, that, that you are, apparently so. I can see that, I can see that. Now, tell me a little bit, uh, I've heard another name that's kind of floating around in the news these days, Uriah. Tell me about Uriah. Uriah, that was uh, also a mistake. It's uh, a lot of damage. Uh-huh. Well, what does Bathsheba that? What does that? What does that mean? Bathsheba became pregnant. Okay. Well, that's not uh, good. And I called Uriah back mm -hmm. from the war mm -hmm. uh, and, and tried to get him mm -hmm. to go back mm -hmm. and spend time with his wife. Mm -hmm. But he didn't listen to me. Mm -hmm. What did he do? He slept with the servants outside my door. He what? refused. I know. I'm why? Kidding. Why did he sleep? He's supposed to do what I say. Right. He didn't do it. So why did he sleep with the servants? I don't get that. Well, he had integrity. I okay. Suppose. Yeah, just a little, little old, that's a, that kind of gets in the way sometimes, I suppose, I mean, yeah. You know, it would have been fine if you had listened to what I told him. Right, to right, right, right. Uh, but he didn't. So, so what I, happened after that? Well, I had invited him in, mm -hmm. got him drunk, mm -hmm. tried to send him home, mm -hmm. he didn't listen again, mm -hmm. went and slept outside. The, Is it that integrity the, thing again? It's, it's it, again. Wow. Wow. I know. Wow. I'm the king. <laughs> you know? I can see. So what happened after that? He, uh, I sent a message with him uh -huh. to my general okay. to have him put in uh, the front lines right. uh, when the war was heavy. Yeah. And I had, uh, I had him draw back mm -hmm. leave him out there. Okay. What happened after that? He was, he was killed in the back. Okay. Wow. 
and you ordered the general to do that. Is that right? So I, I got a question. I got a question. So how? I don't know. This is kind of inconsistent. The man after God's own heart business that I've, I've always heard about. Uh, can you give me some sense of what's going on in your soul right now? Sorry to hear that. We do have a pastoral counseling team. We'd be happy to meet with you. <laughs> Can you point them out? Yeah. I actually threw that door right back there. All right. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for coming. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, I'll take that. I'll, I'll drop it. Thanks, King. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. All right. Chapter 11. In, uh, in 2 Samuel covers the events that uh, King David just, just talked about. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to think about some of the things I heard in this little uh, interview of sorts that relate to truth, transparency, and, and trust here. Uh, there's actually a pretty important word that pops up that, that, that King David actually mentioned only once, and it's the word sent. It happens to show up 23 times in chapters 10, 11, and 12 of 2 Samuel. And here's how it shows up. David sent Joab, his general, his main general, he sent Joab, uh, sent Joab to war. Then David sent for Bathsheba. Then David sent for Uriah. Then David sent a message by Uriah back to the front lines, General Joab. And out of this, we can see pretty clearly that, ooh, pretty clearly that, David trusts himself. He's very, very confident in his own abilities, and he trusts himself. And maybe the flip side we could say is that he trusts himself to the degree that he doesn't trust God. What about transparency? Uh, when he sent Joab to war, David remained in Jerusalem. And so the scripture is very clear about this particular issue. The phrase, David remains in Jerusalem, has implications that he wasn't supposed to be in Jerusalem. In fact, he was supposed to be out on the battlefield with his men where he had been war after battle after war after battle after war after battle again and again and again. And in fact, he had probably developed these very, very deep bonds with his men. And all the important people that he had deep bonds with were out on the battlefield at that time. And guess what? He is in Jerusalem, getting up in the evening, sleeping all day, getting up in the evening, bored, silly. So perhaps, in the spirit of transparency, when you have this restlessness inside that you're not doing the things that God has designed you to do, perhaps there is a signal that something is amiss and the opportunity for transparency to connect the way things ought to be and the way things really are, the ability to connect those things, maybe transparency would help with that. And then, of course, when he is out on the rooftop, this is when he notices Bathsheba, and he sends for her. And then when he sends for her, the servant that he sent to go find Bathsheba goes, well, wait a minute, isn't she the wife of Uriah? And, and i got to think that at this point, David is again confronted with the truth, right? This, there is a reality of the things the way things ought to be and the reality of the things that are inside of his heart and he's confronted with that with this very simple little question by the servant and he can choose at that point to come clean. He could choose transparency, but of course he doesn't. And then Bathsheba sends him a note saying, I'm pregnant. And of course, as almost always is the case, the cover-up the little fudges that we have in our life are almost always worth, worse than the coming clean. And so he has a chance again to be transparent at this point, but he doesn't. He sends for Uriah, and when Uriah comes and has this unbelievably, uh, this great amount of integrity before him, he won't go sleep with his wife, despite the fact that David sent him and gave him a gift to go spend time with her, and the fact that he tried to get him drunk and did get him drunk and sent him to go spend time with her. He lives this life of integrity probably in the exact same manner that David had taught him to live. David, the leader, David, the man's after God's own heart, had probably taught him how to behave in exactly the same way. So when he's confronted with this integrity, I'm quite certain, I've got a feeling that, oh, you remind me of myself when I was the man after God's own heart, and he could have come clean, and he didn't. And you can see this descent in the darkness 
through all of this. You know, he's not in, he's in Jerusalem and not on the battlefield. Well, I, I kind of get it. You know, he's 50 years old. Maybe he's a little bit tired. Maybe he doesn't quite have it like he used to have it. Maybe he wants a break. On the surface, that doesn't seem so bad, does it? But it's the lack of transparency that causes the next issue. And then this just cascades over and over and over again until finally he has such a deep trust in Uriah that he won't look at the message that David gives him to send to General Joab that will be his death sentence. He has this deep trust. You can see that the gap between what ought to be and what actually is is extremely large. What about truth? I think what I've been saying, what I've been trying to say throughout all of this, is I'm going to suggest that there are two ways to think about truth, and that is the truth of the way things ought to be, and the truth of the way things actually are. And transparency can close the gap between those two things. So maybe we can think of our lives as, or David's life in particular, as this pure, pristine water, a man after God's own heart. And what happens if we drop a bit of impurity in this water? Of course, visually speaking, (laughs) it gets a little bit cloudy, right? But then, of course, this is the first time this happens. Uh, It's just taking a break from the battlefield. The next time it happens, things are a little bit darker when he sends for Bathsheba. The next time that this happens, uh, John, yeah, something just jumped up. Yeah, the next time it happens, a little bit darker, a little bit darker. And as we see, David finds himself in complete darkness. God says at the end of chapter 11, the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. There's a gap between the way things ought to be, the way things actually are, and over and over and over. David has not chosen transparency. And it's very clear at this point, not only does he greatly trust himself, he's having trouble trusting the God that's made him. And during this period of time, as, as King David said earlier, as Ryan said earlier, he begins to groan, he begins to write things like, I think I have that up there. Yeah, these large gaps, sorry. He begins to write, write things like my bones are in anguish. I feel like it's a hot, humid summer day. God, your hand is heavy, heavy, heavy upon me. I think it's what happens in our lives when there is this gap between the way things ought to be and the way things actually are. We feel a little bit of friction, a little bit of dissension, a little bit of tension inside of us, whether those things are a result of our own decisions or perhaps the decisions of those around us. So as we consider costly love, as we consider love is truthful, the question I think we have to ask is, well, why no transparency? What's the cost behind all of this? Is it perhaps exposure? Is it uncertainty? Is it risk? And of course the answer is yes, yes, yes to all of these things. And you think about David, there is a certain amount of risk if people find out he's actually slept with Bathsheba. Oh, by the way, Bathsheba's grandfather happens to be one of David's closest advisors, Ahithophel. Oh, by the way, David's sons and daughters, no doubt, know that there is another woman besides mom in the palace. Oh, by the way, this little secret that is just David's secret, he thinks that he's trying to cover up, he's trying to avoid any exposure to, is in fact slowly seeping out into the public. Brene Brown um, calls this, she's, she's, a, she's a woman, a sociologist at the University of Houston. If you Google her name, uh, B-R-E-N-E Brown, she's got an awesome TED talk that she gave in 2010 where she talks about this idea of vulnerability. And she says this, idea, this exposure to uncertainty, this exposure, uncertainty, and risk are at the core of what vulnerability is. And these are the difficult emotions associated with this. But in fact, vulnerability is the birthplace of strength, is the argument that she makes. And she says this gives us belonging, 
It gives us joy, it gives us empathy, it gives us worthiness. It's the birthplace of innovation and creativity. So on a sociological point of view, on the one hand, David is clearly choosing things, these difficult emotions, avoiding them at all costs. And at the same time, he's also missing out on the things that God can do within him when he comes clean. My bones waste. I groan all day long, day and night. Your hand is heavy on me, just as it is for my strength was sapped in the heat of the summer. Josh mentioned earlier God's slowness. I think this is, in fact, exactly what's happening here. There's a quote, depending on who you talk to, it's by Longfellow or somebody before him. God's wheels grind slowly, but they grind exceedingly fine. So chapter 11 closes, and one month goes by, Two months go by, and three months go by, and four months go by, and a year goes by, and what has God done? Apparently, on the surface, absolutely nothing. Now, now I don't know about you, but if you're Bathsheba's family, if you're Bathsheba's grandfather, as a matter of fact, you're going, wait a minute, my grandson is gone because of the actions of the man that I advise. God, when are you going to do something about this, as a matter of fact? Bathsheba, who knows what the dynamics were of that relationship between Bathsheba and David, who knows? She's pregnant with a child. Was she conquered? Was it mutual? I, I, have, I have no idea, but certainly the power dynamics are way, way out of whack there. What does Bathsheba think inside of her mind? What are the kids thinking, the sons and the daughters of David, now that this other woman is, has a room in the palace? Well, in chapter 12, we open up with the following. Lord sent Nathan to David. There is that word send again. It's this signifier that yes, God is in fact in charge. God is in fact going to take care of the situation the reality is that David was in no position to experience transparency and come clean on his own sin and his own issues. So what does God do? He sends a truth teller to David. And so what I like to think about is this idea of truth, trust, and transparency from the other point of view on the person that is being asked or is choosing to be a truth teller in somebody else's life. Because there's two aspects of this truth-telling, right? There's how we tell truth to ourselves, how we recognize the, the difference between what ought to be and what actually is in our own hearts, and when we recognize that in somebody else's life. And so a little piece of history here. Nathan is a trusted advisor to David. He had been with him over a number of years. He's a prophet. His particular role is a religious role in his court. And so David trusts him. So if we're going to be truth-tellers, one of the things that I think is important is that there's tr trust involved with the person that we're going to tell truth to. You got to be the right person, in other words. Uh, when Nathan came to David, he said, There were two men in a certain town, the rich and poor. The rich man had a large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he bought. Oh, this is my daughter's monkey, right? Monkey has been with us since Julia was born. She came home from the hospital. Monkey, uh, James gave Julia monkey. So when times get tough in our family, guess who Julia asked for? And it's not mommy and daddy, it's monkey. <laughs> when she gets mad and upset and won't listen to us, if we talk to monkey, sometimes Julia listens when we talk to monkey because monkey talks to her, right? Monkey is a part of the family in our household. And so guess what Nathan is doing right now? He is talking to the equivalent of monkey that's right, in David's life. So the reality is David is a man clothed with immense power. He controls, obviously, the military. He controls the government. He controls the economy. He controls the judicial system, as a matter of fact. And so David is, uh, Nathan is coming to him as the controller of the judicial system in this little scene that we're about to, to, to read. He asks him to make a judgment. And Nathan is very smart. He's heard God speak to him. Nathan, I want you to be the truth teller in David's life, and he appeals to the monkey equivalent. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it, and it grew with him and his children, 
It shared his food, it drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now, a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, yeah, if you're probably familiar with this part of the story, he took monkey. He took the little ewe lamb that belonged to the poor, poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. Let's think about this for a second. A year has passed. David finds himself in darkness. God is working internally. He feels this grinding, grinding, grinding. He can't reconcile this gap between what ought to be and what actually is in his life. God says, okay, I'm going to bring the shaft of light of my truth into David's life. I'm going to have to use David to, uh, Nathan to do it. And Nathan is very smart. He figures out the right way to communicate with David in a way that David would completely understand. And in verse, in verse 5, this becomes very clear. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. One of the other things we can say is that when we're speaking truth to people, not only does it need to be the right person, but it needs to be the right way at the right time. Then what comes next is, is, is perhaps one of the most dramatic scenes in the Old Testament. It's the uh, a few good men <laughs> moments. And David said to Nathan, you are this man. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all of this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Now, you to think about this for a second. Here is Nathan the prophet speaking to a man clothed with immense power, the man who could kill him if he wants to. And, and Nathan knows he has, in fact, done this very thing, killed people he wanted to get rid of. And, Dave, and Nathan is taking this risk, this idea of vulnerability that we talked about earlier. David shied away from it, but Nathan, in fact, leans into it. And he goes on. He's not just saying, God would have given you even more, David, if we continue to follow him. He says, uh, why did you despise the word of the Lord? I mean, the hits just keep on coming here by doing what is evil in his eyes. You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. And then it, it just it, it keeps going, honestly. But then the Lord says, out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity upon you. So there's a question that, that sort of comes up in all of this. How do consequences fit in? How does grace fit in? How does mercy fit in? Liz talked about forgiveness last week. How does that all work together here? And, and so here, in, in these next several verses, and, and to be honest, a lot of them really bother me a lot. Nathan is really clear there's going to be some significant consequences. And as a matter of fact, David's son, um, Amnon, raped his sister Tamar. Absalom, one of David's other sons, was so sick about that, he killed his brother. Uh, then Absalom decided, you know, I need to have a coup. I'm going to overthrow my dad. Um, and then the grandfather of Bathsheba, Ahithophel, guess what he did? He joins in the coup with Absalom. Significant consequences all over the place. And eventually, at the end of David's life, General Joab also abandoned David. Significant consequences. But here's the good news. In verse 13, then David said to Nathan, at long last he becomes transparent, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin, you're not going to die. But because by doing this, and you show an utter contempt for the Lord, the son that you have will be born will in fact die. 
And so what we have here at the very end, David, yes, there's significant consequences. You're not going to die. But God has this long-haul view. As a matter of fact, another son was born named Solomon. And out of Solomon's line, eventually came Jesus to offer forgiveness not only to David but to me and to you so a few things to think about how do truth trust and transparency work together the cost of truthful love is vulnerability David had the hardest time doing it Nathan chose it and because Nathan chose vulnerability and transparency and truth-telling, we have the possibility of grace and forgiveness in our life. And David later writes about this. Cleanse me with hyssop, I will be clean. Wash me, I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. And he experiences the forgiveness that he couldn't have before or he had difficulty receiving because he couldn't be transparent. There's a scene right at the end of the Shawshank Redemption that I think captures a little bit of the struggle that I have with transparency in my own life. Uh, you're probably familiar. I'm going to show you the end, so sorry. Spoiler alert. You're going to see the end of it now. A um, little bit of context. Andy Dufresne was imprisoned. Uh, probably wrongfully, he was probably an innocent man. He was a banker. Once he get in prison, once he's in prison, the corrupt warden figures out he's a banker, and uses Andy to divert money into his bank account. Um, but then Andy is a smart, cunning kind of person, and he diverts money from the money that gets diverted from the bank account into his own bank account, and plots his way year after year after year after year, 20 years as a matter of fact, plots and plans and waits for the right time and the right way to escape. Andy crawl to freedom through 500 yards of shit-smelling foulness I can't even imagine. Or maybe I just don't want to. Five hundred yards. That's the length of five football fields. Just shy of half a mile.
love that file image. Right? I love it. So I think, for me, being transparent is a lot like crawling through a 500-yard line, sewage line. But at the end of it, there's freedom. It's the freedom of purity and pristineness that God can give us and Jesus can give us. As King David said, wash away all my sin. It's that freedom that comes with that. So the question I'm asking tonight really is one, where do you see yourself in this story? Maybe you're David on the roof. You're just tired. You don't really want to be in battle. Just, I'd rather not do the things that God has sort of made me to do right now. I need to take a little bit of a break. Maybe you see yourself as David in the midst of his darkness where God's wheels are grinding and grinding. Maybe you see yourself as David after confession. Maybe you see yourself as Bathsheba's family. You haven't actually done anything wrong, but yet you are experiencing the difference, the gap between what ought to be and what really is. And maybe you see yourself as Nathan, someone that needs to be a faithful, loving truth teller in somebody else's life. So do you have any gaps? We would love to pray with you to see those gaps closed in your life. And we're going to give you a couple of different ways to engage this. Uh, we're doing things a little bit different tonight, as you can tell. Uh, we're going to have communion, and we're going to have the prayer time all at once. And so if the prayer ministers want to go in this corner, that corner, that corner, that would be awesome. And so if you have any gaps at all, maybe they're as a result of the decisions that you've made, maybe they're a result of decisions that somebody else has made. Any gaps at all that are creating some tension, some dissension, and you feel these wheels grinding ever so slowly, we would love to meet you in that. Uh, the other way that you can engage this is you can come to the communion table. And as you can see, uh, we don't have red stuff here. We have something else that signifies the purity, the cleansing that God can bring us. So on the last night, the night that Jesus was betrayed, he told his disciples, here is my blood in the form of wine. Here is my body in the form of bread. Take this and remember me. So. As we begin to worship in just a minute, come, take communion. We have uh, recycle bins back there for you. Take a bottle, take a piece of bread, go back to your seat. Meet with somebody to pray with them, or do both. Do you have any gaps in your life, any sense of exposure, risk, or uncertainty that would require vulnerability before your brother or sister or before God?